and on the 13th of June 1962, something happened. The first military coup in Africa was staged. Togo's Silvano Solimio was the victim of that coup. Now, from 1963 to the turn of the millennium, there was an average of four military coups a year on the continent. Now, this seems to have faded towards the end of the 1990s. However, uh, post the year 2020, we seem to have entered a new area of coups and military instability. Generally, on the continent, specifically in the sub region. Carlos Rivera, professor at the University of Valencia, was studying the Sahel situation and counted that we had up to 100 million people living under the military rule. Sixty percent of citizens, and this is according to Afrobarometer, are dissatisfied with the way the progress works. But there is hope. Seventy percent of the citizens, again according to Afrobarometer, within the region still prefer democracy to any form of government. So there is hope. But there are other problems. And that is why we are here. Policy actors, distinguished statesmen, scholars, the general public, to figure out how we can stem this problem. Once again, welcome to this simple, simple chat, Decline in West Africa, a conversation with policy actors. Once again, my name is Godfred Akutubwafu. And to set things off, I will welcome Professor HBC Prempe, the Executive Director of the CDD Ghana, to give us a welcome address. Good morning, um, Your Excellencies, um, Honorable uh, Members of Government, uh, Council of State, other state institutions, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, I am happy to welcome you to today's program on democracy decline in West Africa, a conversation with Larry Diamond. I think the fact that the title is democracy decline in West Africa suggests that there is something anomalous about the development or phenomenon, which is somewhat not too bad, which means that we have had some somewhat of a golden age of democracy that is uh, slipping away and therefore uh, gives cause for concern. And indeed, West Africa led the way in the third wave, so-called third wave of democratization in Africa, which began with Benin's historic and trend-setting national conference in 1990. That very momentous event led to the toppling of the country's long-serving soldier autocrat Kereku and paved the way for a transformative democratic transition in that country. A country which, like most of its neighbors, was very notorious through the 60s, 70s, and 80s for coups d'etat. Since then, through a combination of constitutional reforms, democratic elections, and presidential term limits, the region saw some profound changes, including peaceful turnover in government and leadership succession in Benin itself, in Ghana, in Nigeria, Liberia, Senegal, Sierra Leone, reversing the region's long and inglorious tradition of authoritarian regimes, military hunters, and civil conflict. At the regional level, the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, became the first among regional blocs in Africa to set 
and support democratic norms through the adoption of the Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance in 2001. And ECOWAS indeed came close to institutionalizing a two-term limit for presidents as a regional norm in 2015. We are all also familiar with ECOWAS's uh, intervention in the Gambia, which forced out Yaya Jame to finally leave office after he had lost that country's uh, election the previous uh, month. ECOWAS called that operation, Operation Restore Democracy invoking Article 45 of its Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance. Since the 2010s, however, we uh, who follow the trends in democracy in the region, who follow Afrobarometer, follow other measures of political liberalization and democratization, have noticed a trend of democratic decline. While the more recent coups d'etat are the ones that have attracted attention, in fact, democratic decline and backsliding or recession has been noticeable in the West African region <clears throat> even prior to the coups. We have seen manipulation of constitutions, to prolong terms of presidents whose terms were otherwise aspiring. When you follow Freedom uh, House's ratings or any of the others that measure democracy over the period, you would see that the continent, the region has indeed um, been experiencing a prolonged period of democratic recession. But for most of us, the wake-up call has only come recently through what ECOWAS calls unconstitutional changes of government or what we call on the street military coups d'etat. And the return to West Africa of the military coup has given grave cause for concern and justifiably so because those of us who have lived through, who lived through the 70s and the 80s and the periods of military coups uh, are quite familiar with the harvest, the harvest of wars that attended those um, unconstitutional changes of governments. We have had in this region, as a result of such interventions, the experience of civil conflict, failed states, gross human rights abuses, humanitarian crisis of transborder in nature, and we in Ghana have also indeed had the experience of hosting uh, many of those refugees from other parts of the region who had to flee their countries because of the turmoil that really could be traced to many of these military coups and anti-democratic activities. So I think it is only appropriate that we begin to look at this very closely. Um, I think there is some empirical evidence to suggest that when it comes to democracy, the rise and fall of democracy, or whether democracy thrives or with us, has some neighborhood pattern to it. So these things occur in neighborhoods, just as the um, the rise of democracy uh, was somewhat of a neighborhood phenomenon in West Africa. So I think is the decline. So it is only appropriate that we, we look closely at what's happening in the neighborhood um, and what we might do about it. It's not enough to be the lone democracy in the region, and I'm not referring to any country in particular, but if you are in a region where democracy is declining all around you, I think you must be concerned. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that it will be exported to your country, but it can also degrade the quality of your own democracy as you look at your neighbors and you benchmark your own conduct or quality against them and you think, well, we are not as bad as A or B or C. So democracy decline is something that must concern all of us. And we at CDD have actually uh, responded to this development in the last uh, few years, in, in 2021, we started to look uh, out from Ghana, where, which has been our base for over 25 years now. Uh, we do, of course, through Afrobarometer, have quite a, a bit of a, a footprint across Africa, but in terms of our advocacy and democracy promotion, we have tended uh, over the last couple of decades to focus mostly on Ghana. But in 2021, as we observed democracy uh, going southward and uh, prospects of democracy dimming in the region, we led a group of civil society organizations in the region uh, to put together a network, a transnational network of civil society organizations with the aim of standing up and standing together to defend democracy and to reclaim the democratic space that we were losing. That led to the inauguration in September of 2022 in Accra of the West Africa Democracy Solidarity Network, WADEMOS, as we call it, which brings together a number of civil society organizations and other civic actors in West Africa, in the ECOWAS region, to stand together in solidarity with one another, to push back against the democratic backsliding, and also through collective action to engage the regional and other uh, um, actors in the region, including national actors, on uh, uh, issues of democracy and in an attempt ultimately to reverse the trend towards autocratization. So Wademos has been very active in this space. We currently, at inauguration, we had about 32 members from all 15 ECOWAS countries. Uh, now our membership is uh, upwards of 45, and we have been doing work with our partners across the region um, our delegation hasn't uh, returned from Senegal yet, uh, where we were uh, to show solidarity with our members uh, in connection with the elections held on Sunday. Uh, we were also in every one of the countries that has held an election since uh, January of last year, which means we were in Nigeria, we were in uh, Sierra Leone, we were in Liberia, and we intend to continue. Beyond elections, we uh, have been dealing with our uh, partners in the um, cool-led countries. We call them the countries in transition. We have a, a, a platform uh, exclusively for the countries in transition where we engage regularly um, with them and um, to think about uh, ways of getting the countries back on course. In fact, in the course of uh, the last two years, we have made two missions to Guinea. Uh, uh, during uh, those missions, we were able to meet with civil society, with political parties, and in fact, with the junta itself. So it's a, it's a, it's a busy agenda, uh, it's an ambitious one, but we think that through this kind of solidarity, we can begin to sow the seeds of what ECOWAS itself projects to be a transition from an ECOWAS of governments, ultimately to an ECOWAS of the peoples. Um, because we believe that we swim or sink together in this enterprise uh, and that it is not good enough to think uh, only locally um, without acting regionally. And again, that it's also not sufficient to think regionally and not act locally. We want to blend the two. We're thinking locally, acting regionally, 
thinking regionally, acting locally, and acting across borders with our partners in various countries. Um, we are happy to say that one of our partners um, in this enterprise has been the Council on Foreign Relations, Ghana, uh, led by Ambassador D.K. Osei. Uh, we have other partners in Ghana, but most of our partners are outside of Ghana in both uh, in Anglophone, Francophone, and Lusophone countries of the, of the region. So we in civil society are doing our part uh, to respond to this development. And among the things that we do is convene conversations like these. Um, and I will get the opportunity to introduce Professor Larry Diamond, but we are very, very uh, happy to have him here when he uh, informed us that he was planning a visit to Ghana uh, to see uh, his friend, Professor Jima Bwadi. Uh, we couldn't miss the opportunity to arrange for him to share some thoughts on, on democracy and what's going on in the region. We have, since his arrival last week, been able to organize a number of forums for him to interact with students. Um, we also had uh, last week uh, a, an, an event for um, young civic activists uh, within the Wademos region. Uh, so they were in Accra, and uh, he again made himself available uh, to meet with them and share some thoughts on democracy. And yesterday we had them in the office for our own staff. You know, charity begins at home. So uh, he also met with our staff at CDD and engaged in some really very, very interesting and very exciting conversation about democracy, prospects, and other things. So today, the idea is to uh, expose him to the public, more or less, and uh, get him into a conversation uh, about democracy and uh, about democratic uh, democracy decline in West Africa. And in, in very short order, I will explain to you why the choice of uh, Larry Diamond is about the best that we could have made for a topic like this. Um, and um, you will all understand that we indeed have the right person to speak uh, on this subject. On that note, uh, I will retire to my seat. Uh, welcome again to this morning's event, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, Executive Director of the CDD Ghana. Um, we will take some opening remarks as well, and um, I am very honored to introduce our next speaker, uh, a distinguished diplomat, one of the very best this country has produced for many years, served as the pen of the president. Um, these days, he represents the Council on Foreign Relations in Ghana. Let's welcome Ambassador D. K. Ose. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished panelists, Your Excellencies, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, on behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana, I'd like to thank CDD for, as usual, working, welcoming us to be part of this very important discussion on the decline of democracy in the sub-region. Fortunately, in his opening remarks, both the, my friend from CTFM and Kwesi have given us a broad uh, analysis of the political history of the decline in the sub-region. And generally, we all seem to agree that there is a decline, and that, that that decline is partly attributable to the very political economy of liberal democracy. And that is where our difficulty has been at the council, and I'm sure when you've looked at our recent uh, publications, we've argued that uh, the political economy has brought in its wake globalization, automation, artificial intelligence, the changing nature of work, social media, 
And all, this, all these have resulted in uh, enormous dissatisfaction of its citizens. Many citizens are asking, so what has democracy brought us? Is there a delivery gap? They want to see uh, an end to growing inequality. They expect social mobility. They want social protection restored. And they want the balance between economic growth and the equitable distribution of resources. And we also notice that all these uh, challenges to the growth of the democracy are occurring in a period in the world where there are major geopolitical tensions. I'm not just referring to uh, Israel, Hamas, or COVID-19, or Russia, Ukraine, or the distortions in logistics uh, and transport of goods in the subject. I'm, I'm also referring to the difficulties and the challenges of defining what democracy is. I mean, given what is the judgment of the ICJ in recent times, how are we going to define human rights? If you look at the vote in the Security Council yesterday, for instance, we are beginning to see dramatic changes, not only to multilateralism, but to the very definition of what democracy should represent to all of us. Now, there's also the issue of uh, disinformation and uh, misinformation, which fortunately I noticed CDD has started working on, and that is an area I hope going along in the, this discussion we can discuss some very concrete activities which uh, we can do some work on. I think we generally agree on what the underlying factors are. What I'm not sure about is if we agree on the responses that we need to bring to address the decline or the backsliding of democracy in, uh, uh, in the sub-region. I noticed some of my friends who are present here in academia, and they have been recommending uh, several proposals. They've talked about the importance of constitutional reforms, and civic education of citizens, They've talked about the strengthening of anti-corruption institutions. They've spoken often about the promotion of inclusive politics, the institutionalization of preventive diplomacy and conflict resolution. Some, I saw an article we talked about, targeted efforts to increase women and youth representation in government. And they've also discussed the threat of violent extremism and terrorism. But I mean, for us practitioners, diplomats, we like to deal with concrete things. What does this all mean? How are we going to respond to the decline in the democracy? And I will take some specific examples. You know, in recent times, over the last three months, there's evidence of what civil society organizations can do to slow down the decline of the democracy in Senegal. And I'm not just talking about the advocacy of the civil society organization. I'm talking about the evolutive nature of civil society work during the crisis. And I was discussing with Kwesi a moment ago how impressed I was about the way civil society organizations in Senegal changed their nature and built new civil society organizations the last two months. An example that I was explaining to Kwesi was that they emerged an association of uh, law faculty lecturers who were commenting on all the constitutional court decisions uh, which Makisal was in the haste to try and throw overboard. And there's no doubt in my mind that these law lectures had some kind of impact uh, on the process which has led to Fai's election. But are there examples in there that could be learned for other countries? For instance, in Benin, it is true that President Talo has agreed that he's not going to go for another term. But the recent uh, bill that is introduced in parliament, which all religious bodies and uh, political parties and opposition parties believe it's a direct attempt to prevent uh, potential presidential candidates from the opposition from standing elections at all, 
what can civil society do about matters like this using preventive uh, diplomacy? And I think in all these countries, including Guinea-Bissau and Sierra Leone, there are immediate preventive diplomatic initiatives which we can take as civil society organizations. One of the questions which we have been a bit uncomfortable asking is that when as uh, civil society organizations, we are faced with young, adventurous, populist soldiers who have no intention whatsoever of handing over power. So we know where the negotiation stands. And we've been uncomfortable dealing with this issue. The issue really is that many of them have no intention ever of handing over power. What is going to be our response to some of these uh, dilemmas. I believe that was the purpose of this uh, discussion and I'd rather just leave it at this point and hope that during our discussions we can delve into some of the p possible solutions which can uh, stop this backsliding of democracy in our beloved sub-region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador D.K. Osei. Now, we're also doing this um, with our partners from the Kofi Annan International, Peace, uh, Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And um, I will call up the commandant of the center, Major General Richard Adojani, for his opening remarks. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to stand on the well-established protocol and say good morning. I must say I'm very delighted to be here to deliver these opening remarks at this all-important forum. I would first of all like to thank the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, for partnering with, the, with us and the Council of Foreign Relations to organize this event. Distinguished guests, I think the team for this policy dialogue, democracy decline in West Africa, a conversation with policy actors, particularly with Professor Larry Diamond is very timely. Considering the development in the governance in the security landscape in West Africa, sub region in particular, and in Africa in general. The state of democracy globally points to a steady backsliding. Suddenly, the attractions of democratic dispensations seem to be fizzling into so much disillusionment, with greed and avarice constantly now in at the very fabric of the people's democratic aspirations. This has been characterized by the sustained and deliberate process of subversion of basic democratic tenets by political actors, governments, and restive militaries. The contagion effects are being felt most in transitional democracies that account for a quarter of the world's population. Quite regrettably, however, all this is happening while authoritarian systems intensify their repressive practices and engage in more blazing attempts to narrow segregate spaces and distort the workings of democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, from the 1990s, the limitation inherent in Africa's political transition, a significant number of countries have made the difficult tra this transition from full-blown military, oblique, civilian, authoritarian regimes to various shades of multi-party democracies. However, 
the expectations of what these transitions could bring in terms of development, social welfare, effective parliament, judiciaries, and competent political leadership have either been short-lived or failed to deliver on the most basic of the spinners of democracy. To that end, most states and people on the continent are yet to experience the real dividends of consolidated democracy and good governance. This is because for most of these states, the conditions for a free, all inclusive and democratic elections continue to remain elusive, to say the least. While the rhetoric about democratic processes in West Africa created a perception of inadequate but abide gradual pro progress, the sub-region has been facing two critical developments since 2010. Firstly, is the challenges of democratic consolidation, and secondly, the growing insecurity. This notwithstanding, the region was once hailed as a bastion of democracy. Between 2015 and 2020, there was not a single undemocratic change of power in West Africa, indicative of a period of real stability. Unfortunately, however, since 2020, democracy has rapidly declined in the region. We've had seen six successful and two attempted military takeovers, a pain of seemingly grossing over some of the conditions that degenerate in, into regime changes, we could say for now that the coup d'etats in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, among others, are all indicative of the decline of the state of democracy in the region. They also point to the inability, unwillingness, or incapacity of democratic regimes to equip their militaries to take the fight to the extremists. Distinguished guests, it is worrying but that despite efforts by African regional institutions like African Union, ECOWAS, and the international community at institutionalizing democratic governance, the, gov the, the continent is currently facing a democratic reversal. These reversals are characterized by the unwillingness of Africa's multilateral organizations to evenly apply the normative frameworks that member states have voluntarily signed onto. This has regrettably resulted in increasing patterns of endeavors by its political leaders to evade fixed term limits. It raises serious concerns in this regard if after all the political maneuvering to remain in power, the protesting public is rewarded by a clampdown on their civil liberties, when all they are doing is demanding the right to have a say to who rules over them. The end result is that democratic reversals in all its shapes and forms continue to fester and pose a threat to the stability and security of the region. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot end this intervention by teasing out a few critical questions that I hope the men and women in power on the continent might assist in finding answers to. First, how best can we ensure coup d'etat proof democracy in Africa? How should elected leaders act when they are in power? What is the relationship between the promises given in the quest for power and the actual capacity to deliver, failure of which leads to mistrust and a fundamental breach of the bond between the ruler and the ruled? Are we only paying lip service when we say democracy at its practice in our part of the world is the best form of government in our experience? If yes, how can we strengthen it for the realization of people's aspirations? If not, what can and must be done to make it adequate 
and able to suit the people's needs. These and other, other questions, similar questions, must never cease to agitate our minds as we strive to find an antidote to the canker of democratic reversals that continue to threaten the path to progress on our continent. Examples abound about cases that indicate that the democratic reversals we are discussing encompass multiple levels of failures, including the failure to let the Africa peer review mechanism bite when its fathers unraveled, to put it mildly. Ladies and gentlemen, leadership and governance are intricately locked in a delicate stand, dance of the people's perceptions and aspirations. It is these kinds of relationships between expectations and output that are sometimes capitalized upon to commit what for me I deem as the greatest evil that a person in uniform could commit against his own nation. I'm talking about the overthrow of a democratically elected government, no matter how unpopular it might be. We must, however, be bold and ask why coups have become so popular in our part of the world, to the extent that they are actually hailed when they occur. Whilst most adventurous coup makers usually ride on the unpopularity of ruling government to execute the agenda, we must, however, perhaps also ask, who makes these governments so unpopular to put their countries at risk? Leaders might play into the hands of disgruntled individuals by setting us of commission and omission that make them the target of political agitations. But I do not believe that it lies in the purview of armed personnel to decide the fortunes of the people. I believe that although the continent and the region are facing reversals, Africa's political and socioeconomic development can be achieved through deepening institutional effectiveness inclusiveness and robust engagement of multiple stakeholders in holding people in office accountable. Leaders should be seen for fighting for their people and citizenry, but not fighting for themselves. Browsing through the various meanings and connotations of the world constitution, one thing that permeates the respective Description is the fact that it sets the parameters within which rulers and the rule may engage with each other. That being so, one then wonders why in Africa the ruled almost always see so much power and authority to rulers, said that the latter becomes untouchable as far as accountability is concerned. The question to ask is, why doesn't the community craft the constitution to ensure institutional efficiency, effectiveness, and inclusiveness to the last letter? In politics, why must the winner always take all? Why is it not possible to draw knowledge and intellect on the other side to assist in nation building? Why is it so difficult to hold rulers accountable? even after some of the violence acts against the people's rights. It is a common stance that most Africa's constitution give too much power to the executive to the extent that sometimes the very institution of leadership becomes the source of instability and a threat to the state. Perhaps something needs to be done collectively about this. The authority of regional institutions in enforcing the norms of democracy and good governance is increasingly being questioned. ECOWAS in particular has sought to enforce and elicit compliance with its norms from recalcitrant member states while simultaneously balancing and ensuring that ad hoc cooperative security initiatives involving these states can deal with extremist threats in the Sahel and the, and the coastal states. 
but this has not been done consistently. Therein lies the challenges and credibility gap that the course is facing. It is concerning that negotiating pitfalls posed by inconsistently enforcing its democratic ethos has undermined ECOWAS credibility and threatened it with disintegration. Distinguished case, it has become obvious that normative frameworks on democracy and good governance have some limitations and thus require revision. The Kofi Annan peace Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, which I, I head, as part of our core values, will continue to work in promoting democratic governance, leadership, and security through our research, training, education, and policy dialogues. It is our strong belief that good democratic governance is a necessary condition for peace and security and hence development. It is my fervent belief that this policy dialogues provides an avenue for all of us to revive our energies and advocacy within the framework of putting pressure on governments and institutions to ensure that the gains of green democracies are consolidated. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to espouse my views in a democratic manner in this democratic space. Thank you for your attention. A big thank you to Major General Richard Adu Jani of the KAIPT, Sikofian and International Peacekeeping and Training Center. And we'll also hear from Her Excellency Virginia Palmer, the US Ambassador to Ghana. Madam? Good, good morning, everybody. I, I will say all protocols observed, and I will protocol you when I observe you. I, I am really honored to be here and on a, at, at a forum organized by three really important Ghanaian organizations, um, CDD, the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, and the Ghanaian um, Council on Foreign Relations, and, and to address these really important questions. And it's so important to be doing this in Ghana and doing it now. Um, I'm also looking forward to hearing Professor Diamond's um, comments. I was saying to him that I'm in the middle of ill winds, protecting democracy or saving democracy from Russian rage, Chinese ambition, and American complacency. Um, I don't want to steal your thunder, Kwesi, but um, that stings a little, that title. <laughs> but um, I think because it hits so close to the bone. Um, and I've been conscious being ambassador here um, as America and Ghana have their elections at almost the same time, that democracy is not something that we say check, um, accomplished, um, and then move on to enjoy. We have to fight for and protect um, every day. Um, we have to fight injustice and discrimination. Um, we have to fight encroachment on democratic institutions. We have to beef up the institutions that are responsible for delivering democracy. And, and we mustn't think about it just in terms of the ballot box. We have to think about it in terms of governance and delivery of service and inclusive economic growth um, and, and justice um, to our citizens. And only then um, will democracy be safe. Um, organizations in Ghana, such as the National Peace Council, the National Commission on Civic Education, the Electoral Commission, and the Ghana Police Service play critical roles in Ghana's elections. And the National Peace Council and the National Commission on Civic Education are two uniquely Ghanaian institutions that could and should be copied around the world. Their efforts ensure that the voice of the Ghanaian people is not only heard, but also respected and acted upon. However, as, as the previous speakers have outlined, we find ourselves at a moment in which democracy strength is being tested around the world, and especially here in West Africa. In recent years, some parts of West Africa have witnessed a distressing decline in democratic norms and a weakening of democratic institutions. This has been characterized by a resurgence of authoritarian regimes, a rise in violent extremism, pervasive corruption, alarming human rights abuses, discrimination against minorities, 
uh, restrictions on press freedom and free speech, and a failure to share economic prosperity equitably. These factors not only undermine the fabric of democracy, but also erode trust in the very institutions meant to safeguard it and protect human rights. Those countries that stepped away from democracy are now even less secure than they were before their democratically elected governments were replaced by military juntas. On multiple occasions, we've seen rampant and state-sponsored disinformation used to manufacture narratives and spread false information that undermines elected governments. That's not to say that these West African governments um, were perfect. Um, they weren't. Um, and I think something that's very important to discuss today is the need for consistency in calling out attacks on democracy, not just by soldiers, but um, by all kinds of people and by disinformation and by corruption and discrimination. Um, but the massive onslaught of disinformation has undermined democratically elected government's mandates and accelerated their downfall and made life for the citizens of those countries more complicated, not less complicated. A study by the African Center for Strategic Studies released earlier this month found that disinformation campaigns in Africa have surged nearly fourfold just since 2022. They have 198, excuse me, 189 documented disinformation campaigns in Africa, 19 in Mali, Burkina Faso out in Niger alone. Make no mistake, disinformation is not the only reason for the decline of democracy in West Africa. It's also about the inability of elected governments to deliver on their promises, share economic prosperity, fight corruption, uphold the rule of law, bolster democratic institutions, improve security, and deliver for their people. And I used to think there was a continuum between security and democracy, or security and liberty. Um, and I've come to realize that it's not nearly that simple. I, I used to think that you know, mothers and fathers would take choices to surrender some of their liberty in order to protect their children so that their daughters didn't get raped when they stepped outside the gate. Um, but again, it's not that simple. Um, discrimination against minorities causes grievance, which then make those groups vulnerable to recruitment by violent extremists, for example, which then create a downward spiral for security. Um, corruption also undermines the institutions that protect security and, um, again, creates a violent, a violent often, but, but vicious downward spiral. When a democratic government fails to live up to expectations, the solution is actually more democracy, not less. That's important to remind people. Millions of people around the world living under less free regimes still clamor for democracy every day. And as we've seen around the world, democracy can be fragile. It needs to be protected, and it needs to deliver for those people. President Biden made defense of democracy a core pillar of American diplomacy. And just last week, Secretary of State Blinken attended the third sum summit for democracy in Seoul, South Korea. Um, President Biden launched the first summit in 2021 as a forum to share ideas and organize collective action to address emerging challenges to democracy. At this year's summit, Secretary Blinken highlighted collective and individual countries' efforts to fight corruption, promote free and fair elections, protect independent media and journalists, and uphold and defend human rights. Building a strong, inclusive economy is also important to supporting our democratic principles. And through multi-year implementation of something called the Strategy to Prevent Conflict and Promote Stability, the United States is working to do that in coastal West Africa. And we focused efforts in Ghana on inclusive economic growth and projection of state services into Ghana's much poorer north um, and to the protection and inclusion of vulnerable populations on, on Ghana's border. As we look ahead to the upcoming presidential elections in both the United States and Ghana, we must reaffirm our commitment to the principles that underpin a democratic society. Democracy can triumph over adversity through the promotion of shared economic prosperity, the conduct of free and fair elections, the inclusion of minority in public policy debates, and the maintenance of well-trained security forces that can counter violent extremists while protecting human rights. My team at the Yes Embassy is working with journalists, civil society organizations, government officials, local communities, underrepresented groups, and civil society organizations like the ones who've organized this forum um, to support free and fair elections in Ghana that truly deliver for their people.
because free and fair elections here and in the United States will continue to be a sign to the rest of the world that democracy is alive and well. So I look forward very much to the conversations today. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Her Excellency Virginia Palmer, the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana. And we are almost at that point where we can bring up our guest speaker, uh, Professor Larry Diamond. And uh, I'll not be introducing him, no. I'm giving that honor to somebody else. And I'll tell you about that person. But um, I must say that I'm very happy to see a full room. And it's filled with a lot of people who are important to the message that we are trying to preach when it comes to democracy. And um, if you permit me just a few minutes to acknowledge a few people who are here. Uh, well, I'll acknowledge everybody who is here. Uh, let me, of course, say a big thank you to the Australian High Commissioner, Her Excellency Bernice Owen-Jones. Um, she's here. You can see her there. Um, I also see Her Excellency Shlomit Sufa, the Israeli Ambassador to Ghana, um, over there. Um, I also see uh, Professor Emmanuel Jumawed, he's here, co-founder of Afrobarometer, he's in the front. Uh, Professor Miranda Greenstreet is also here. Let's also welcome from the office of the president, the legal counsel to the president, Mr. Koe Suman is here. Representing the office of the former president is Dr. Michael Kwesa White, he's also here at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, former Attorney General, Madam Betty Moldedrisi is also here. Good morning. <laughs> Distinguished lawyer, statesman, politician, Mr. Samuel Kujoto is also here. Uh, we also have representation from Parliament. Uh, Madam Gloria Kumankuma is hiding somewhere here. Uh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. We also have the EU in Ghana represented here. Thank you. And also we have students, a lot of them. Thank you very much, students from the University of Ghana and also students from the UPSA. Thank you for coming. And so I will bring back uh, Professor HQC Prempe to do the honors. Thank you. Um, so you can learn everything about uh, Larry Diamond from the website of uh, the Stanford University, which has been his institutional home, uh, I would guess, for all of his adult life. But probably even before he was an adult, because he had all of his education, BA, MA, PhD at Stanford, and has remained on that Palo Alto, beautiful Palo Alto campus for the best part of his life as a scholar. So on the website of Stanford University, he is described as the William L. Clayton Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, the Moss Backer Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and the Bass University Fellow in Undergraduate Education at Stanford University. He's also professor by Ketsi of Political Science, by Ketsi of Political Science and Sociology at Stanford University. So this is, this is blue blood Stanford, right? Uh, at the Hoover Institution, uh, he leads the institution's programs on China's global sharp power and on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. And at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, he leads the program on Arab reform and democracy, which is based at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, a center he directed for more than six years. For us in the field of democracy, promotion, and Activism, however, we know Professor Lai Diamond more or less as Mr. Democracy. Uh, and, and that would not be an exaggeration 
Uh, in fact, his name has become synonymous with democracy across the world. And if you think I'm exaggerating, you can Google Larry Democracy and see what it does. It will not pull Larry King or any other Larry. What you will get is just maybe the first maybe five pages will all be about Larry Diamond. And if you switch it around and did Democracy Larry, you would still get the same thing. Uh, he spent a career in the field of democracy, in fact, a field that I think, again, would not be an exaggeration to say he uh, co-founded the whole field of democracy studies and was for 32 years the founding editor of the Journal of Democracy, which has become essentially the journal for all, the most important journal in the field for democracy scholars and others writing on democracy. Larry Diamond is not just a democracy scholar. He is actually a democracy enthusiast, a very enthusiastic promoter of democracy. Although if, uh, from his most recent book, Ill Wings, it's, it's clear that he is uh, not exactly a very happy man. Uh, all of us uh, who are in the field of democracy are not particularly too, too happy with, with where democracy is these days. And uh, his book also uh, uh, reflects that, uh, but he continues, of course, to plow on and remains, I think, ever so optimistic. He has authored seven books and edited or co-edited more than 50 others on democracy around the world. Larry Diamond is not coming to this topic uh, uh, f as somebody who has just studied democracy uh, everywhere else but here. In fact, his career as a scholar began in West Africa. And I think his first book, Class, Ethnicity, and Democracy in Nigeria, um, written, published in 1989, really is what launched him into this field. Uh, so he's very familiar with this region. Uh, his, his roots here go way back uh, to the 1980s. And I think he spent a year or some time uh, in Nigeria living, living studying, and, and uh, doing academic work there. He's also not new to Ghana. Uh, in fact, I think this is probably the second or third time that I have uh, had the Five, you see Jima, who is, who is slightly older than I am, counts five. Five times that he's been here. I, I think I've shared a podium or a, a panel with him in Ghana maybe two or three times. But he's not entirely new here. And in fact, has been a friend of CDD uh, since our founding. Um, in February 20, uh, 2005, he in fact was our... Krontini uh, Akwamu lecture. Uh, he delivered a Krontini Akwamu lecture on the topic democracy, development, and good governance. The inseparable links. And if you know CDD, these are the three components of our mission to promote democracy, good governance, and inclusive.
specifically at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, in December of last year, uh, but that was the lecture, uh, and these are um, the slides I'm going to share with you. And then there'll be an article uh, that will be published next month in the Journal of Democracy that will um, articulate many of these themes. So the first point I want to make uh, is a kind of overview of where we are. As I said, um, we are now in his 17th year of a democratic recession. Uh, I would not describe this as a calamity. As you'll see, there's still a large number of democracies in the world, uh, as has already uh, been, I think, um, very fruitfully mentioned. Uh, there's still a considerable democratic resilience uh, uh, and energy uh, in this region, uh, as you'll see in terms of popular aspirations and in terms of the capacity to beat back uh, ill winds, authoritarian intentions uh, in Senegal and elsewhere and to renew democracy in places like Liberia. Uh, but um, the net movement is negative. Uh, I don't think this is what uh, the late Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington would have called a reverse wave of democratic breakdowns, though I must say if you look at all the coups in West Africa, the military coups, it feels like that. Um, but uh, globally, uh, certainly, uh, there's been a long slump. That's the way I refer to it. 17 years in which levels of freedom and the quality of democracy and the number of democracies, all three of those things, have gradually, steadily, in net terms, with some progress but more regress, been moving in a negative direction. We are in a very volatile period now. It is a period in which there is not apathy. Uh, there was just a summit for democracy, as I think Ambassador uh, Palmer referred to uh, in Seoul recently. Uh, there are many international networks and organizations. Uh, in November of this year, the National Endowment for Democracy will uh, convene maybe its 10th uh, an, uh, biennial um, uh, World Assembly of Democracy in Johannesburg. And there continue to be both regional and international democracy networks that sustain the vibrancy, conviction, and solidarity of democracy advocacy uh, and learning and improvement. Uh, but there are a lot of hostile and malevolent forces that want to roll back democracy, and it's very important that we understand what they are. So uh, I want to... Uh, then just stress um, this, that um, we must insist uh, on a uh, minimum standard of democracy that involves free and fair elections to determine who rules. And this is not a trivial consideration. If you don't have a reasonably free press, uh, independent electoral administration, uh, and the ability of different individuals and parties to stand and contest for power uh, with neutral electoral administration and fair counting of the vote. The fact that you have periodic multi-party elections does not in itself mean that you have a democracy. And I must say, as someone who's been studying democracy or the aspirations and attempts at it uh, for over 40 years uh, with regard to Nigeria, uh, I'm not sure Nigeria really has ever truly had uh, electoral democracy, though there did seem a brief shining moment in 2015 when, for the first time in the history of the country, uh, an incumbent president was uh, turned out of power in a competitive election, and give good luck Jonathan credit 
uh, for doing what uh, many Nigerian leaders in the past um, did not do, and that is accepting defeat and leaving power. Uh, but it's more than even just being defeated. It's having a broader architecture uh, of neutral, fair uh, electoral administration and control of electoral violence and so on and so forth. And then I want to uh, briefly state that there's a higher threshold of democracy that we all should aspire for. And this is the threshold of liberal democracy. And liberal democracy involves um, strong institutions of accountability and a rule of law with protection for uh, uh, individual rights and minority rights. And when vulnerable minorities are picked on uh, and persecuted uh, because they're different. Uh, it may seem that it accords with social norms uh, or religious values, uh, but it's a warning sign for the broader structure uh, of liberal democracy uh, because of two things. One is, and I'll come back to one of these, one is that um, whenever one minority can be persecuted, uh, other minorities are vulnerable, and ultimately individual rights and the rule of law more broadly are vulnerable. Uh, and a liberal democracy uh, is not just a political system, but a social and normative system, which uh, includes uh, tolerance uh, for pluralism and for difference. Uh, in all forms. And secondly, uh, as I'll say, we face a threat now of illiberal populism, of political leaders and movements who feel the need to mobilize support on the basis of some form of collective identity because they don't really have answers to a country. Now, I want to say as well, we cannot take for granted the underlying public commitment to democracy as the best form of government and the understanding of what democracy is and why the rule of law and civil liberties and minority rights uh, and free and fair elections are important to good governance and economic development and uh, to a decent society. Uh, and so this belief in liberal democracy and understanding of what it is must be taught to every generation and renewed in every generation. And civic education is the instrument for this. And so every society should be asking itself, what are we doing in the schools and through our other instruments of uh, public activity, uh, and civil society to educate people uh, in democracy and um, freedom. And uh, if we have a commission on civic education, is it getting the resources and support from government that it needs to do its job? Then I've mentioned civil, uh, social media as a conveyor belt for social um, uh, polar and political polarization and disinformation and how much societies are being more rapidly uh, polarized now and uh, how passions and prejudices are being whipped up and manipulated on social media. Something we really need to be attentive to and I've already mentioned um, the problem of sharp power, power that's covert, coercive, and corrupting by authoritarian regimes that are trying to cut into the soft tissues of our democracies and manipulate their uh, information spaces with uh, propaganda. A big part of the problem here is declining accountability, declining uh, horizontal accountability, that's checks and balances, 
uh, strong independent institutions to constrain the abuse of power, the weakness of societal accountability from civil society and the independent media. I think uh, the international community has fallen down in holding governments to higher standards. And then what about ourselves as individuals and the accountability that we mobilize from our own convictions uh, and adherence to democratic norms? Democracy declines when institutions weaken, political parties, legislators, courts, and, and so on, institutions of the state, institutions of civil society. I mentioned the bureaucracy here as something we shouldn't take for granted. Having a state bureaucracy, a civil service that is professional, neutral, capable, well-trained, with an esprit de corps of professional purpose, with the resources to do its job, uh, and with a commitment to good governance, and uh, to uh, refraining from corrupt conduct is an extremely important foundation of liberal democracy. Democracy declines in the face of poor economic and political performance, and when you get corruption and a decline in accountability and political polarization and populist encroachments on democratic institutions, economic development suffers. People don't want to invest in that kind of environment uh, domestically or internationally. And eventually what you get is not development but crony capitalism and that's a formula for a dissipation of economic possibilities and um, uh, economic stagnation at best. Africa simply can't afford that. It needs good governance to lift people out of poverty. Uh, and it, it can happen uh, at a fairly rapid clip. But it's all about good governance. When you don't have good governance, this is the, the vicious cycle that you get. The state performs poorly. People withdraw trust from the state. Then people stop having confidence in the system and a willingness to comply with it. Uh, crime and corruption increase. And, you know, all the students were complaining on Friday about money politics, how expensive it is to run for office. You go to your constituency uh, and everybody wants money to attend a rally. People are ready to sell their vote. Well, why do people do this? Because the state isn't there to provide the roads, the schools, the health care, uh, the scholarships, and the possibilities for development. Uh, and, you know, the light bulb went off in my head when I was studying uh, the failure of the first uh, republic, uh, and you had the descent into utter chaos and depravity in the western region of Nigeria in uh, the mid-1960s, preceding the military coup. And one robber um, uh, uh, went up to uh, a car and demanded money uh, and the person got very indignant and he said, why are you doing this? Uh, and he said, well, the, the premier has, has his money, I want mine. And if you think that your politicians are just serving themselves rather than the public good, this is what you're going to get as a society. And this is not a formula for, um, for development. Even if you don't believe in democracy, at least believe in development and abandon the illusion that some virtuous leader uh, like Paul Kagame, who's been looting the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, with his army in order to uh, monopolize the resources there, uh, is going to be a paragon of good governance. There are no shortcuts to development. Uh, and the evidence shows overwhelmingly 
that democracies uh, with the rule of law perform much better in delivering economic development than, de de uh, uh, than autocracies do. And then you have all of these uh, different models of authoritarianism now that are uh, uh, temporarily alluring to people until they find out the price that they pay for authoritarianism. So let me come uh, finally in the last five minutes to how we renew um, democratic uh, progress. Um, we have a lot of lessons for how we interrupt and turn back incipient democratic backsliding. And it involves reasserting the institutions of democracy and civil society. Uh, and the earlier, uh, this is one of the most important points I can make actually, the earlier that interventions occur, the more likely they are to succeed. So countries that perceive decline in the quality of democracy, and you just uh, saw it in the, um, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, ratings, but I will show you here, uh, well, somewhere I had um, some slides, I think I may have already showed you, of uh, declining public uh, confidence in uh, democracy. So you can go back to those slides and you'll see that it's not people abandoning faith in democracy, but it's people perceiving declining performance uh, of democracy. So if you want to uh, reverse this, uh, it's better to intervene early when we see signs of declining commitment to good governance. And then you need to activate the mechanisms of accountability, of judicial constraint, of authoritarian executives, uh, of legislative resistance. But of course, a logical person can ask, how does the legislature exercise a check on the executive branch when all of the members of the ruling party in the legislature are in the executive branch? Uh, and is there some need for constitutional reform uh, to uh, unleash and invigorate the possibilities for legislative oversight? We often hear the term the deep state. Uh, that that is the bureaucracy that uh, may be going off on its own agenda. But the deep state, uh, as my colleague Francis Fukuyama will tend, tell you uh, from his vast writing on this subject and his two volumes on political order, is the professional state. It's deep in terms of professionalization, consolidation, having an ethos of serving the public good uh, and the training and norms and capacity building that enable it to be an instrument for uh, good governance, service delivery, and development. Uh, and finally, you get uh, a check on democratic backsliding, a reversal of it, and a renewal of democracy when civil society rises up and mobilizes and calls out the retreat from democracy, uh, mobilizes the moral elements of the community and the ideals of democracy, and builds very broad civic and political coalitions for accountability and for democratic reform. You need to look for these um, allies wherever you can find them, uh, in the moral community, in the business community, in the professional community, uh, in the professional uh, state, and so on, and among politicians who have democratic ideals and would like to be part of a better democratic system.
So uh, that I'm going to uh, conclude now is my presentation, and I hope we can have a good discussion. Thank you. A big thank you to Professor Larry Diamond, a very insightful look into why democracy is on the decline and what we can do um, to save it based on wherever position that we find ourselves. Um, the floor is now open um, to take questions for him. Um, if you are willing to engage, yes. Uh, my sound people at the back, if you can prepare the microphones. And you know, as we prepare that, it's interesting. Uh, the current state of democracy and some of the points he made, I was reflecting on yesterday in Togo, the very democratic change of the constitution and democratic change of the constitution in quotes, which now allows parliament to elect a president and not the public for a six-year term. Um, all done in the name of democracy, of course. But as Professor Diamond has showed us, of course, now we have insight into what is happening. So. Um, let's start with the gentleman in the blue cartoon. Just put your hand up and then I will call you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I may not qualify even to congratulate the speakers, but I've really learned a lot. I have a very simple, straightforward question for Professor Diamond. When you identified the drivers of the dysfunction, you mentioned social media and technology. But when you listed what you thought should be the most important interventions, you did not talk about that. Was it deliberate? And in raising the question, I want to emphasize a point that both you and the Ambassador Palmer made about the report that was released by the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. If you look at that report, first of all, when you raised the alarm that this information has gone up fourfold. The report itself admits that that is a serious undercount. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that they were studying campaigns, not disinformation generally. That is one. Number two is that they were studying disinformation operations within social media and online outside traditional media. Afrobarometer already tells us that in Africa, 70% of the people access their information through radio and television. So that in itself gives you an idea. The third level is that this study does not account for disinformation in local languages. So if you look at these three levels, it tells you that if we were to account for disinformation fully, perhaps we may be dealing with something more scary. And this is the reason why I come back to you to ask, was it deliberate that you leave it out in your proposed solutions? Thank you. And please, your name and where you My name is George Sapong. I work with the National Media Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Sapong. <laughs> Professor Diamond, go ahead. No. Can we take okay, all right. Then let's take a few more. Please mention your name and then okay. where you're coming from. My name is Fatih Sivyar, and I would like to ask Professor Larry Diamond, um, in his opinion, what role does the executive factors, specifically international interference, have to do with democracy decline in West Africa? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more uh, from the gentleman in the seat at the back, and then we'll come to Professor Diamond, and then we'll do another round of three. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I must say, I really enjoyed the um, presentation from Professor Larry Diamond. Um, however, um, in my opinion... Your, your name, sir? Yes, um, sorry. My name is Edward Bruce Lau, and I work for the National Development Planning Commission. I wanted to find out from Professor Larry Diamond his thoughts or views, any views he may have on the contribution of the global financial system being a bit unfair to the declining the democracy we are seeing in, in, in the sub-region. Thank you. Okay, so let me take two more from okay, the gentleman Hello. there and then on to the, the gentleman in blue. And then 
there's a lady at the back. Thank you. The country that has a stable democratic government, health theory you mean their governance on? Is it the structural theory, functional theory, or the conflict theory? I, I think maybe hold the microphone a little closer, the one that works, and ask your question again, because I didn't hear it. Okay, let's do the question again. So I want to not that close. <laughs> I wanted to find out um, the countries that have a stable democratic government, if um, they practice either the structuralist theory, the sociological theory. I wanted to know if they practice the structuralist theory, the functionalist theory, or the conflict theory. And then uh, the lady at the back for the f end of the first batch, and then we'll do another five. Hi, I'm Ali Kim from CDD. Um, so I wanted to know, uh, what are your thoughts on the theory that capitalism is actually killing democracy? Because I know these two, technically these two concepts are supposed to survive. You need, you need democracy for capitalism to thrive and you need some elements of capitalism for democracy to thrive. However, you have the idea of capitalism where private actors are acting in their own self-interest, meanwhile democracy is supposed to benefit everyone. So how is it that, the, so that's where you end up in a situation where a lot of African countries are, where their country becomes, is for sale, where the line between private and public becomes bled and the, it almost seems like the private is running the states as opposed to public actors. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on this theory, and also if maybe the, the solution possibly to having a more symbiotic relationship between democracy and development is looking for a human rights, human rights based approach where the principles of human rights, that is equality, non-discrimination, are at the center of um, legislation and policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Professor Diamond, you have a first batch of five uh, from Mr. George Sapon, from Fatih, from Edward. We had um, the young gentleman in blue and then Elegan from the CDD. Okay, good. And if I misunderstood a question or two, you help correct me. Okay? I certainly will. Uh, so first to George. Thank you, George, for coming and um, sharing. Uh, the principal reason why I did not go into social media is that it would really require a, another lecture uh, for me to get into that level of detail. I have a chapter in my books, uh, Ill Winds, about um, social media. I think that we have a lot of work that we have to do to uh, address it. The problem is that, it, multiple problems. One is that the social media companies uh, have incentives that are very misaligned with democracy. Of course, uh, we get to the capitalism question. There are for-profit corporations. Uh, their uh, ambition is to maximize profit. They are al also increasingly Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon in a different way, monopolistic actors, and that's a problem. So a lot of what needs to be done involves legislation in the United States and probably Europe or parallel legislation in democracies around the world we're starting to see that the European Union um, is really starting to use its antitrust muscle against uh, Facebook and Google. Um, and the core problem is that these companies all have a business model, the social media companies, which requires fixing your attention as a user on their platform. They make money in two ways. 
They make money from advertising revenue, and they make money by having you stay on their platform so they can collect your data. And once they collect your data, they can then commercialize it. Uh, and then if they're a government actor like Huawei, I wasn't pleased to find myself on a Huawei uh, network today, I have to tell you. Um, you know, your data is being collected by the Chinese Communist Party state, uh, and profit may not be the only motive there. But anyway, talking about the, um, the commercial companies, uh, what is necessary to fix your attention on their platform? There's a term for it that was invented by a former Stanford student who went on to become, at a very young age, something called the chief ethicist, the chief thinker about ethics at Google. He didn't last long there, as you can imagine. And um, the term he used was attention addiction. They want to addict you to your platforms, to their platforms, so you will spend as much time as possible on it. The more time you spend on the platform, it doesn't matter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, uh, TikTok, whatever. The more ads they sell, the more data they collect. What fixes people's attention on a social media platform? Well, it could be humor, something funny, watching someone doing something strange or unusual, watching people, you know, sharing their latest fashion or, or cat video or something. But the social science shows, and these companies have armies of social psychologists to do this research, that what most fixes people on their platforms is anger, outrage, shock, um, and indignation. And so if they're feeding you things that make you shocked and outraged and indignant and more militantly feeling what you started feeling before, what happens? You get more and more angry, you get more and more polarized, you start going down a rat hole. And anyone who's been on YouTube, you know, you finish one video, they show you another video you might like. And they try to show you videos that are going to make you more angry, more outraged. You no, know, it's an incremental process. And you wind up being into um, communication circles that reinforce your biases and make you more angry and more outraged and believing disinformation and um, getting indignant about... Uh, things that are not the real challenges facing your country. Because the real challenges of why a country isn't developing, you know, might be complicated. They might involve boring issues of uh, investment policy, tax policy, uh, the structure of governments, constitutional reform. It's much easier to just get angry about something more graphic and emotional. And so this is going to require a lot of complicated work to fix and challenge and to get transparency in the algorithms of these companies and so on. Uh, I don't think um, it's going to be possible to censor the social media in order to do this. But I will just say before moving on, it is important to uh, call out dis and recognize disinformation. And I do think societies around the world need credible, independent actors that can look at the social media horizon and say, and we've had a, uh, a, a social media lab at Stanford that's been doing this, um, this is disinformation, this is not real. And moreover, we've done the research, and this appears to be who is organizing the disinformation campaign, as the paper 
you cited from the Africa Center notes in terms of Russian and Chinese sources of this disinformation. So it's a very formidable and complicated challenge, but there are things that societies can do, and they each need to form their own antibodies, their own responses, their own vetters, at least to identify and expose disinformation. Now, uh, the second question I think was about executive structure. Did I get that right? What's the desirable executive structure? Yeah? Uh, you mean like pr pr presidential, prime ministerial? So here's one piece of advice. When everybody, somebody says to you, oh, I think it'd be good to have a six-year term for um, president or prime minister. No, 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 no. Six years is, I don't care if it's presidential, prime ministerial, or, you know, some other system uh, that, you know, somebody is inventing. Six years is too long a time to go in between popular mandates. So that's my first reaction to the institutional reform in Togo. The second reaction is that these things tend to be context sensitive. And when you've got a leader who's um, proposing a reform, presidential to parliamentary, parliamentary to presidential, you always need to ask, what's the motive here? And if the motive is so that a president of Togo can then make himself a prime minister of Togo, and maybe evade term limits, that doesn't count either. That's no good. So if you're, uh, I'm kind of agnostic between presidential and parliamentary rule. I have a slight bias for uh, parliamentary rule, but as we've seen in India over the last few years, as we saw in Bangladesh over the last 10 years, under the rule of Sheikh Hasina, the prime minister there, who just rigged herself into another term in office. Uh, and as we've seen in other cases, parliamentary rule is no guarantee of the uh, sustaining of democracy. Uh, any executive, prime minister or president, can desecrate and violate the rules. Um, and I think the key principle is, and this was well articulated in an article by my former student uh, and colleague, uh, now a professor of political science at UC Berkeley, Stephen Fish, in an article in the Journal of Democracy maybe about a dozen years ago. The important question to ask is not what is the executive structure, presidential or parliamentary? It's what is the structure of accountability around the executive and what is the independent power of the legislature to monitor? And whether it's presidential or parliamentary, um, the legislature has to retain significant power and motive uh, and logic to investigate the executive branch, hold it accountable, and not simply be a mouthpiece uh, for the executive elected, uh, uh, executive, elected executive. And in particular, okay, there is a certain logic in a parliamentary system to having some members not a hundred members, but maybe 25 or 30 members of the parliament constitute the cabinet, okay? In a parliamentary system, the norm is for the ministers to come out of the parliament. I personally, as a political scientist, have a very strong principled view that if you have a presidential system, there should be real separation between the legislature and the executive. And I believe, as a matter of principle, that it is a mistake to have members of the parliament be members of the cabinet when you have a presidential system. 
Uh, people want to be appointed a cabinet minister, I think they should have to resign their seat in parliament. And uh, in any case, what Steve Fish shows pretty convincingly through his research is when you have a strong independent legislature, you have a stronger, more resilient democracy. Now the next question is about the global financial system and is it part of the problem? Yes, it's a big part of the problem. But I'm, I may not be thinking exactly about the global financial system and the way you're thinking about it. I don't know. Um, you know, part of the global financial system that people often have in mind when they say problem is the World Bank and the IMF. They have a mixed record. I think they're part of the problem in this sense. Uh, when they come and say, let's negotiate a loan for your development, or they come and say, okay, you've got a fiscal problem, you've run your country into a deficit, your currency is declining, you want to borrow money. It's all just, at most, economic conditions. Okay, here are the economic policies you need to follow. These institutions almost never ask the deeper question of why aren't you developing? Or how did you run this fiscal deficit? Uh, and they never, um, or almost never, ask the obvious question about what were the practices of corruption uh, and misuse of public funds and waste of public funds on vanity projects with big construction uh, fees that could be routed back into the ruling party and individuals that landed your country in uh, the basket case of needing a bailout from the IMF. And I just can't understand it. I've been arguing with the World Bank for, I don't know, 35 years since the days of um, Babangida in Nigeria about their failure to insist on better governance as a condition for lending. And one time, I, it was one of my finer moments, if I may say so, as an academic, I actually got uh, the resident official of the World Bank in Nigeria to fess up and say, um, uh, essentially these words, I don't care about governance. It doesn't matter if there's corruption. You know, one way or another, if you bring the money in, uh, it, will, um, it, it will be spent it'll circulate into the system and um, it, it'll, it'll eventually, a, a rising tide will lift all boats. And I thought to myself, what planet are you living on? Uh, and this arrogant man who was feeding money uh, into corrupt military dictatorship in Nigeria was just enabling the de-development, not the development, but the demise of development uh, in Nigeria. And I, I just think it is a tragedy, uh, if not a crime, um, that um, the financial institutions have not been requiring governance reform as a condition for your lending. So if that's what you mean by the global financial system, that's half of my answer to your question. But the other half uh, is an extension of the, uh, of the dilemma we're facing. And there's a chapter in uh, Ill Winds on this, too. You haven't gotten to it yet, but I think you'll like it, Quasi. Uh, and it's about global kleptocracy. The people who are ripping off the money of their public uh, in various countries around the world that are called emerging market countries, but not all of them really have uh, markets that are developing, uh, they don't keep it in their country. Uh, they keep some of it in their country, but much of it they send abroad. Uh, and then what happens to it 
is you get armies of lawyers and accountants and publicists and K Street lobbyists and facilitators and business agents and real estate agents who launder this money, make it respectable, and um, you know, help themselves to a share of it along the way. There is a vast conspiracy um, internationally uh, in which the United States, Britain, France, uh, the Gulf states, and a lot of others are conspiring uh, to help recirculate these stolen billions, and they really amount to trillions, into the international f uh, financial system, the banks of you know continental Europe, London, New York, Singapore, um, uh, UAE, and so on, and their various property markets, and so on. It's really a scandal. It's an enemy of development, and that's part of the global financial system that I'd like to see change, and I have some ideas about how um, that are in the book. Uh, between sociological theory, conflict theory, functionalist theory, other theories, uh, uh, you know, I don't really think in these terms. I'm glad you didn't mention Marxist theory. I think it's run every country that has tried to apply it into the ground uh, and been an utter developmental failure. So, um, uh, I have democratic theory, and I have presented it to you today. Uh, and my democratic theory, uh, and I'd say liberal pluralist theory more generally, is create a constitutional system uh, with checks and balances, good governance, a rule of law, strong institutions of... Uh, public and societal accountability. And people will come to like that system and development will happen. But if you don't do the deeper, if you don't attend to the deeper constitutional requirements of accountability, and if you don't ensure that these various institutions that are necessary for liberal democracy, the judiciary, the legislature, the counter-corruption apparatus, a human rights commission, an ombudsman or public complaints commission, the electoral commission, the public security agencies, the civil service, and the civil service commission have the autonomy to function, independence from executive manipulation, uh, and uh, corrupt um, exploitation uh, and pursuit of the public good, you know, you won't get development and you won't get sustainable democracy. Anyway, uh, you can call it sociological. I am a sociologist. Um, but I, it doesn't conform to these abstract theories uh, uh, that you articulated, not that there isn't value into using them as uh, tools to try and explore societal functioning and change. Now, capitalism and democracy. Um, you know, capitalism is just having private ownership of the means of production. Since state ownership of the means of production has been a colossal, whopping, corrupt, developmental failure, uh, I vote for capitalism as a better way of organizing the economy. But there are many forms of capitalism. You know, some people think, well, Sweden, Norway, you know, these are really socialist countries. They're not socialist countries. They're capitalist countries with social market economies in which there's substantial taxation of income and businesses to redistribute wealth. And as a result of having, uh, 
you know, healthy levels of taxation, not so much that business doesn't have an incentive to invest, but enough so that you can finance a professional state and redistribute wealth in the pursuit of social justice to reduce and eliminate poverty, they have the highest levels of human development of any society in the world. So it's not just capitalism, it's what kind of capitalism and what are the instruments for social justice, social welfare, redistribution and regulation that temper the selfishness of capitalism, which is necessary to motivate people to invest and produce with the justice mechanisms of the social market economy. I think that's the magic formula. And I want to say that um, the regulation of global capitalism is needed uh, uh, now on an international scale because of this problem of kleptocracy. And that, that is not capitalism, that is, you know, pirate capitalism, it's greedy capitalism, uh, it's unregulated capitalism. It is the capitalism of a book I recommend to you by Raymond Baker called Invisible Trillions, which is how this kleptocracy works. And it's not the only form of capitalism we can imagine. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take two questions and then we'll wrap it up. The young lady that has had her hand up for quite some time. So her first. Okay. Okay, and then we'll come rough down there. Okay, and then the young man there. So three questions to wrap up. Three, I'm sorry. And I mean three questions. So you get a question, you get a question as well. Hello. Hi. Yes, your Hi. name, and please ask the question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so, um, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Muhibat, a student from the University of Ghana. Larry, thank you so much for such an enlightening presentation. I feel so elated to be part of this impeccable um, congregation. Throughout your presentation, I noted down some phrases from your, from your slides, and I wanted to retreat and um, hit, hit more nations on that for me. You made mention of populist thrive. Yeah, hold the microphone just a little bit further. Okay, all right. So the populists thrive. I, I noted that when you were presenting. You said the populists thrive um, as a hindrance in relation to cynicism and distrust, in, distrust increasing. But to reiterate, Huey Long, um, the then governor of Louisiana from 1928 to 19, 1932, and the senator... The U.S. Senator then, from 1932 to 1935, he was a populist, and then he said, every king a man. Every man a king, sorry. And then there should be a redistribution of wealth through the share of wealth initiative. And so in our parts of the world, being sub-Saharan Africa, and best, let's, let me lower down to Ghana, what best model from all the models you postulated or have been postulated by others and have been used by other countries, Though they have their own pros and cons, but with the likes of the Bukele model and all of that, what best model do you think actually ascribes to our, I don't know, but it's like, it's always something that is so disheartening to think that we still can't figure out one thing that could work for us, but others have been able to do it. And then we still make, make names and make mention of them anytime we are relating to our situation. So what best model fits us and also... Now that's the only question you're allowed. Thank you. Yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Greenstein. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate Professor Damon for an excellent presentation. He's done very well for the whole of Africa. And as a Ghanaian, I'm more interested in how some of his ideas can help us move forward in Ghana because the systems that we are operating at the moment all have problems. Our educational system, our health system, our judiciary, 
our legislature, the executive, you name it. All of these are pro problems. And yet, we believe in moving forward. Does he have any ideas to maybe give to us as to how we can begin to start reforming this society of ours? Because, Prof. Diamond, you seem to have done so much. And congratulations for all the hard work that you've done for Africa. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And then um, the young man in purple. Bye bye. Okay, so my name is Gamma Jacob Kofi from the University of Ghana and the Political Science Department. Um, lower the microphone a bit. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just saying lower it. It's too close to your mouth. So from the University of Ghana, the Department of Political Science. Prof. Larry, I really, really like your perspective on the word democracy and the factors causing it to decline in Africa. Um, actually, I have a very simple question to ask you this, mo this afternoon. The question I want to ask you is that um, in Africa here, gerontocracy has been one of the systems that has been practiced for so, so many years. And also, that was last weekend. Senegal conducted an election. And at the end, a 44-year gentleman won. He is a very energetic youth. And I want to ask you, Prof. Larry, what are we supposed to do as an African youth or Ghanaian youth to also help produce more youth-led government in Ghana or in Africa? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Diamond. So um, there are similarities between uh, Mohiba's question and Professor Greenstreet's question. We can put that together and then Joseph's question as well. Well, you realize that you're asking someone from a country where the two presidential candidates are both give or take around 80 years old uh, to comment on the possibilities for youth-led government in Africa. And uh, I'll begin by saying it sounds pretty good to me. Um, I think, you know, there are many uh, things that will facilitate this, okay? Uh, and certainly addressing the issue of money in politics is one. How that can be done uh, when it's so expensive to contest for parliament uh, is uh, a very important question. And then I think it's to think analytically about what are the channels, what are the conveyor belts that uh, could accelerate the political careers of younger political leaders and maybe start them into more national political consideration. So I'll say the following. Number one, I think it is never a good idea in a democracy to have the central executive appoint the executive leaders of towns and cities. Um, democracy requires uh, the election of leaders at multiple levels, not just the national level. Uh, I actually think Kenya made a huge stride forward constitutionally uh, when they created uh, all of these county governments with directly elected um, uh, uh, county uh, officials, executives. So you, first of all, you disperse the stakes in power. And you also, it's more democratic than having it be appointed. And you start elevating uh, potentially more youthful talent that shows what it can do at a local level and maybe 
rises up as a, as a result of that. So uh, I think that having constitutional and political reform that would make it easier for campaigns to be financed or provide alternative channels for people to advance into parliament and uh, enable uh, you know, more authentic uh, democratic uh, leadership to surface at the local level. Uh, I think these are some possibilities that would invigorate democracy, provide um, some new pathways for young talent. Now, I'll mention one other thing that I briefly surfaced the other day at CDD, but I've been thinking more about it. You have, what, 275 members of your parliament, all elected from single-member districts. Well, you know, um, the first past the post system, the British system, there's one representative for each district, and whoever gets the most votes wins. That's, and that's the American system and the Canadian system. It was the Australian system. They modified it in certain uh, ways. It was the New Zealand system. They abandoned it. It's where the world was. It's not where the world is going. And the world is going toward more innovation and also adopting some forms of proportional representation or some role for proportional representation in Parliament. It's expensive to um, win a seat in a single member district and you all know the reasons why and the money that has to be brought to bear, bear in terms of retail politics. Um, a lot of countries now have mixed electoral systems. Half of the members are elected from single member districts, half by party list proportional representation. Or at least there's some additional layer of election from, uh, uh, from PR lists. It's very difficult to change electoral systems because the existing members don't want to surrender the means by which they got elected. The easiest way to loosen things up here and lubricate the system would be to enlarge the parliament. People might resist it, they probably would, because they'd say, we're already paying X and Y for this parliament, and now you're going to add 50, 75 members or so on. Uh, but, you know, truth is, a parliament of 350 members is not outrageous for a country the size of Ghana. And um, nobody would be threatened, because nobody's district would be shrunk uh, or collapsed into a smaller number of districts. And anyway, if you added a second layer of a party list, a PR list system, and let's say you at least elected 50 members, 75 members from a party list, uh, and people had a second ballot, a second, okay, I'm gonna vote for this party uh, in the constituency, but now, you know, who do I want on the party list? They might say, well, you know, for this extra portion of the seats, maybe we'll take a flyer on something else. Maybe we'll take a flyer on a youth party or a, um, a, uh, uh, a good governance party or political reform party or something like that that's appealing to the nation on different grounds. The other thing that would be uh, useful about it is you'd get more women in parliament because you could require, and if you did this, I think you should require, that on the party list, the ranked party list, 
every second person on the list had to be a woman candidate. Uh, and that's often a way that people get, countries get more women into parliament. So that's my answer to your question. Um, now to the professor uh, who was asking me about how Ghana can uh, turn the corner on these practical problems of education and health of underperforming legislature and judiciary. And more broadly, um, reform and re-energize uh, this wonderful country of Ghana. Um, I really do think it's all about governance. And um, it's about renewing governance purpose and reinforcing the moral call to purpose with the practical, <laughs> you know, stimulus of consequences for, for bad behavior. Uh, we'd like, we have an honor system at Stanford, you know, but we find, uh, I, if you think about human nature, I hope this doesn't shock you, yeah, we still get cheating at Stanford. Uh, and you know, what reigns in cheating is when students get caught and punished. And what reigns in corruption is when public service uh, officials get caught and punished. And what catches and punishes them is not somebody that's captured by the executive branch or ruling party that doesn't want accountability. It's independent institutions, professionally led, with a sense of purpose, autonomous resources, autonomous appointment procedures, ownership and support from civil society. You know, and you have to ask. Every society needs to do, every democracy needs to do, I was going to suggest that CDD perhaps lead in this, a periodic audit of its institutions, an audit of democracy. How well is it doing? How well are the institutions doing? What are the needs for reform? And I think um, most countries, if they do an honest, open-minded audit of their democracy, will find problems and areas for reform. And I've already suggested some. Uh, that occurred to me, you know, with, uh, I will admit, a fairly brief and shallow uh, acquaintance with the structure here, the best people to do the audit are the ones who live here. And once you do the audit and um, develop an agenda for reform, uh, Professor Prempe now knows I've got an idea for how you can push this forward. And that's to gather a random sample of all Ghanaians uh, and bring them somewhere across the country, wherever. Uh, bring them together and have them deliberate with one another on the state of the country and the proposals for reform. You give them pro and con arguments for and against each reform proposal and let four or five hundred ordinary Ghanaians randomly chosen think about the state of the country and the possibilities for reform and render their opinion to the country. I think it would be a very interesting exercise. We call it a deliberative poll. We have a uh, deliberative democracy lab at Stanford that has been uh, uh, doing this in uh, different places around the world and in the United States. And maybe that would help to uh, move along the reform project in Ghana. Now the first question in this second round uh, is, I love your quoting Huey Long, thank you very much. I think you were at, were you at CDD Ghana on Friday? Yeah, I recognize you. You asked a good question then, too. 
So I can see you have a lot of good questions. So obviously, you've been reading about the US. You've been reading about different models. Um, what is the best model for Ghana? Uh, and my answer is very simple. It's the model that you come up with by a democratic process to make your democracy as responsive, accountable, respectful of individual rights, upholding of the rule of law, and facilitating of broad-based development as you determine it can be uh, with the political institutions you design. Uh, and I think that every country needs innovation and reform. I'm now, uh, times change and needs change and ideas about what's possible in terms of political institutions change. Very few countries had proportional representation a century ago. It's a movement that's really gained more momentum, you know, in the last 50 to 70 years in particular. And um, these ideas about more robust institutions of horizontal accountability, that's a product of recent decades. The movement toward mixed electoral systems, that's been a movement of recent decades. And you might think of things nobody's thought of. You know, they, we helped Mongolia do a deliberative poll to deliberate on some proposals for electoral reform. And this small but vibrant Asian democracy decided they liked the deliberative poll so much, the one I was describing, that their parliament passed a law that they couldn't, the parliament couldn't adopt any more constitutional reforms unless they had first convened a deliberative poll of the country to solicit informed national opinion. Uh, that's an innovation. Mongolia was the first one to do it. So, you know, my advice is um, don't accept any model as the model. There is no one model, and the models need to keep constantly changing. And the best system is the one that is reformed and adapted and informed by the circumstances of each country. Thank you very much, Professor Larry Diamond, for an absolutely enthralling session. A round of applause, please. I'm sure we all enjoyed that and we all learned a lot. Um, we are at an end, but not at an end completely. Um, we can all make our way towards the lobby uh, for some refreshments and getting to know one another a bit better. Um, so, uh, yes, we will call it a day. Uh, Digny, please, please, you can head back to the holding room um, where we'll also meet up and have a chat. But thank you once again everybody for making time with the CDD this afternoon and with Professor Larry Diamond. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>